432 million adults, 35 million children. That's how many people suffer from impaired hearing, from severe hearing loss, approximately 5% of the world's population. It's estimated that by 2050, it'll be as high as 900 million. That would be one in every 10 people suffer from hearing impairment, hearing loss. And so the question becomes, how well do you hear? We don't protect our hearing the way that we should or think about it the way that we should. You know, it's interesting. We, we protect ourselves in so many other ways quite instinctively. You think about when you look outside and you see that temperature gauge and it says minus 10 degrees, if you can imagine such a thing. <laughs> minus 10 degrees, you're not going to put on shorts and flip-flops and go outside because you know that would be dangerous. You know, whenever we have dangerous gases or something like that in our homes we have those carbon monoxide detectors to warn us or perhaps when something is too bright we protect ourselves think about welding where we at least have something to protect our eyes knowing that if we don't do that we will damage our eyes and yet when it comes to our hearing we don't seem to protect it as as much as we should there is a way to measure sound levels, and it's called the decibel. And there are certain levels that are dangerous. A, a normal conversation is around 60 decibels. If you double that number to 120, that's the threshold of pain. And just to give you an idea of, of that pain level, a gunshot is about 155 decibels. And that's obviously painful if you're standing next to it. But what's interesting is anything above 85 decibels is damaging to your hearing. That's about the level of a riding lawnmower. And yet, we often don't pay much mind to it. And we don't, we don't really do anything about it. And so therefore, we have those millions that are suffering from hearing loss. But it's not the end of the world. The onset of that, at least there is, there, there is still hope. There are those hearing aids. But you know what's interesting is that only one out of every four people who could benefit from hearing aids, actually use them. And when it comes to spiritual things, hearing is very important. There are millions who suffer from hearing loss. And, and it's sad that they don't have to, they don't protect themselves because it's the same thing as overexposure to, to lies and things like that that they're not, help, not protecting themselves. And yet, not all hope is gone. There's still, there's a hearing aid, and it's called the Word of God. And we can listen to that Word. And that's what I want to talk about today. How do we hear? You know, we talked about last week the, the who and the what and the why of hearing. We know when we, who it is we're supposed to listen to, that's Jesus Christ. The what are we supposed to listen to are the words of Jesus Christ. And the why is because there is a life or death situation that we are faced with. But then the question becomes, well, how? How are we supposed to hear? And the Bible says very clearly, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. That's how you hear. But I submit to you there is a little bit more to that. That is absolutely correct, but we need to look at the context of what Paul's talking about when he said that to show us truly how we can hear. And so if we look at Romans chapter 10, that's where we're going to be if you have your copy of God's Word. If you'll open it to Romans chapter 10, we're going to be looking at this passage, verses 13 through 17. And we're going to look at, notice that there are certain things in this passage. There's a coming to Jesus part that's involved in this passage. There is a comprehension of what Jesus is saying in this passage. And then finally, there is a commitment to that. And that's how we hear. This is so important of not only who, what, and why, but how are we supposed to hear. That faith cometh by hearing, and this he passage helps us to discern that even more. Consider that first point. Read with me in, in Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 13. <clears throat> 
For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. See, this is that coming to, calling upon the Lord. Now, you might recognize this as also being cited in other parts of the Bible. Whenever Ananias said to Paul, Arise and be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. But then also, Peter used this in the very first sermon. That sermon that, that he gave to, that, that very first gospel sermon that he gave on the day of Pentecost, day of Pentecost, whenever he said, call upon the name of the Lord. And it has such, and indeed, this summoning, this to invoke, to, to appeal to. Now to be clear, let's make sure we all understand each other. You are not the one being called. You're the one doing the calling. There's not some voice that you're going to hear in your head or, or something magical is going to happen because Hebrews 1, verse 1 and 2 says that God speaks to us through His Son. He no longer speaks to us directly. And so you're calling out to God. And in this case, it's a come to Jesus moment. I don't know about you, but whenever my mama said, boys, we're going to have a come to Jesus moment if you don't get in there and clean your room, that was not a good thing. What it meant was that I needed to submit to her will. I needed to bend to her desires. What's well, exactly what it means when it says, calling upon the name of the Lord. You are bending to His desire, submitting to His will. It is a coming to Jesus moment. That same moment that those, those Jews heard on that day of Pentecost, when Peter said that. You see, he was preaching to them. And remember what they said. They said, men and brethren, what shall we do? They were asking to be rescued. Same thing as the Philippian jailer whenever he said, what must I do to be saved? And the answer in both cases was Jesus. You see, that's the first point. The first step to recognize that you are lost. And you must find yourself at the foot of that cross that Jesus died on for you and me. That's where this calling comes about. It's a come to Jesus moment. When we come before Jesus recognizing that we are frail, sinful individuals. Now it's important to understand also that this is a citation from the old prophet Joel. In Joel chapter 2, verse 32. And that's what these men were responding to. Peter was explaining to them that that listen, this miracle that everybody heard and that these, these flame-like things on our heads and the, the talking in the voices, this is not because we're drunk, as he says in Acts chapter 2. He says, no, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he goes on to explain and all those men begin to understand. And he says, this is what was spoken and notice that he says, men in Israel, hear these words. We're talking about hearing today. And the very first words that came out of his mouth after that was Jesus. See, it all starts with Jesus. It's a coming to Jesus moment. It's when we come to that foot of the cross. Now notice also that it says, whosoever. And that's what he means. And Paul says, whosoever. And the prophet and Peter, they all are saying that this is open to everyone. There's no exclusion that everybody is susceptible to this. Everybody has this ability to be able to come near and far. And so faith comes by hearing. And it starts by recognizing that this is a moment when we submit to His will. We acknowledge that He is Lord and Savior. And that we must then do what He asked us to. You look back in the same passage in verse 9. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. You see, calling upon the name of the Lord is a submission to His will. It is doing what He desires. And that's part of the how of hearing. That second point, as we continue reading here, it says, How then shall they call on Him? in whom they have not believed. And how shall they believe in Him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. 
You see, once you come to the foot of the cross, once you have realized it's a come to Jesus moment, then there has to be a comprehension. That's what we're seeing here. Understanding what's being said. Do you understand what that means? It means it has nothing to do with your opinion. It has nothing to do with what you think or your preconceived ideas. You submit to God's will, to Jesus, and you must comprehend what He's saying. So Paul asked several rhetorical questions. He goes, how is it possible to call? How is it possible to believe? How is it possible to hear or to preach or to sin? Well, you can't is the point. You can't do those things without it. Now, what I want you to recognize, what I hope you see here, is that there's a process. There's a pattern. And that's going to come into play again in just a few moments. That that is something that we must do as far as his teaching. It makes perfect sense. When you consider that same Peter who used this verse in 1 Peter, 2 Peter 3, verse 16, it says there are certain things that are hard to understand. And in the Scriptures, and some people take those Scriptures and twist them. Now what does that imply? It implies that there's teaching involved. That we must learn the Word of God. Now doesn't that harmonize perfectly with what Jesus said, and go ye into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. See, this teaching part, of this comprehension that's part of it, of making disciples. Now you've got to understand also that these words were penned, this, this <clears throat> section, How Beautiful Are the Feet, were penned by the prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah wrote this in a time of captivity. And he was telling them that, that the, this news, could you imagine being a Jew in captivity and seeing somebody, this messenger, come to you to tell you that you're going to be free. You're going to be able to return home. That no longer are you going to be in captivity. Then you would say, yes, those are beautiful feet coming to me. And that's exactly what Paul is using this here, saying that those who preach the gospel... Those who bring this news of Jesus to others, how beautiful are their feet. It is indeed a beautiful sight. When we consider why, well, you know, perhaps there's something that's impeding your hearing. Something gets in the way of the messenger. Something gets in the way of your hearing. Have you ever had picked up a, a, get a phone call and there's static on the line, and you can't quite hear what's being said. Or how about this? The worst thing is going through the drive-through, right? Would you like roll, roll, roll with that? Do what? Those those drive-through speakers are the worst. Maybe something's impeding you from hearing, interfering from you hearing God's word, from hearing Jesus' voice. For example, our sin. In Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2, the prophet there says that your iniquities separate you from God. You know that hearing is a big problem if you're separated. A distance is, is, makes a lot of times a difficulty in hearing. And what do we do? We get closer to be able to hear. And so distance can cause hearing loss, our sin. What about our own humanity? Bible, Isaiah also says in Isaiah 55, verse 8, My thoughts are not your thoughts, and your ways are not my ways. And what that implies is that we need to get out of our own selves, that we let our own selves get in the way sometimes by allowing our opinions, our preconceived ideas, and the things that we think it should be, or how it should be, or what God should do, or what God shouldn't do, or how He should let me in, or how he, whatever. It's not about you. It's about what God wants. And so we allow our humanity to get in the way. What about that spiritual warfare? We forget about that sometimes. Isaiah talks about that in Isaiah 54, verse 17. And what he's, what he's implying there is that Satan is going to do everything he can to distort the message, to make sure you don't hear. To make sure that you don't hear what, what God wants you to hear. In fact, that's what we see in Proverbs Chapter 1, verse 23. Turn at my reproof. Surely I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you. Because I have called and you refused. I have stretched out my hand and no one regarded because you disdained all my counsel. You would have none my reproof. You laughed at the calamity. And he goes on as to say, because they hated knowledge. They did not choose to fear the Lord. 
You see, this is the whole point. Jesus is not going to foist Himself upon you. God is not going to force Himself upon you. You must choose Him. And so you must hear His Word and you have the choice of rejecting it or accepting it. Now, there's two major points in our passage here when he talks about those who hear and those who believe and those who preach. <clears throat> if you are a Christian, when you read this passage, you need to understand that's you. He's talking about that preacher. Well, the preacher is not just this person standing up here in the pulpit. The preacher is every single one of you sitting in the pews there. We preach the gospel. And so we need to understand that every heart without Jesus is a mission field. And every heart with Jesus is a missionary. Now if you are not a Christian and you read this passage, what you should come to, the conclusion you should be able to deduct from this, is that to call upon the name of the Lord demands more than just believing. It's more than that. There's a process there. There's more than just belief. And He will come into your heart. <clears throat> Think about that for just a moment. As He's talking about this, how shall they believe unless they hear? they got to hear how shall... Let me start over. How shall they call upon Him whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in Him whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach unless they're sent? So what we wind up seeing here is that there is more to it. There is a commitment that is involved. Look at what it says. But they, verse 16, not all have obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We need to understand that when it says they have not obeyed the gospel, that word, maybe your version of the Bible says good news. Or have not obeyed the message. It depends on the translation that you have. But the point is they did not obey what we're saying is they didn't commit. Not obeying is equal to not committing to the Lord. And they rejected Jesus. What? People reject Jesus? They did in His day. And they're still doing it 2,000 years later. It comes down to a choice. And this is proof that just because God reveals the message of truth, it does not mean that everyone will receive it if they don't choose to. Now, what about this idea of believing? Is believing equal to obeying? You need to understand this because you hear this a lot about just believe and you will be saved. What well, is believing obeying? Well, think about this. James Chapter 2, verse 19 says, Even the demons believe. But do they obey? Absolutely not. And so belief and obedience are two different things. And by the, So what it means is that there's more to it. There's commands that are involved. There's more to gaining salvation. It requires an action. It requires you doing something. It's just part of obedience. It's just one part, the believing. Then there's more to it. Now, before we continue further, there's an important concept that you need to understand. That's found in Psalm 119, verse 160. And it is that the sum of thy word is truth. Not S-O-M-E, sum of your word is truth. The sum, as in the totality of your word is truth. And what that means, what that implies, is that you can't just pick and choose different parts of the Bible that you have to take exactly what the Bible says and all of what the Bible says or none of it. It's an important concept for us to understand. And so as we consider, we look at this, notice it says, obey the gospel. Now the Greek word here, you need to understand the Bible is written in Greek. The Greek word here is eungelion. That's where we actually get our words like evangelism, evangelize. And what it means, it means good news and by the way, the word gospel comes from an old English version of that. The word good and spell, which it meant news. So good spell meant good news. And we've translated, transliterated that into gospel. But what is that? It says they have not obeyed the gospel. 
Okay, the good news. The gospel. What is that? Well, the Bible. I'm glad you asked. (laughs) Because the Bible tells us. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the same writer Paul, here he uses the word gospel and he explains what he's talking about. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you. Now think about what he just said in Romans chapter 10 about preaching. He says, I preach to you which you received in which you stand, by which you also are, listen to it, saved. So you're saved by the gospel. You obey the gospel, you're saved by it. If you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believe in vain, for I deliver to you, here it is, here's the gospel, to you first of all that which was received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Isn't that great news? He died, He buried, He was buried, and He was raised again. That is good news if you understand the implication behind it. Because the implication behind it is, this man overcame death. We're no longer bound by death. And so because of that, we're able to have eternal life. That's why He came. He says He came to give us life and to give it to us more abundantly in John chapter 10, verse 10. And so yes, yes, I want some of that. I want that. I want to have eternal life. I want to be in heaven. And according to this, it says I have to obey the gospel. Now the question becomes, how in the world am I supposed to obey dying? How am I supposed to obey being buried? How am I supposed to obey being risen again? That, that, that just doesn't make any sense. So think about it. What is the gospel? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1-4 that we just read shows us the gospel is the death, burial, resurrection. So how do I obey that? Well, I'm glad you asked. Turn with you me to Romans chapter 6. Let's just back up a little bit to what Paul is writing, and Paul explains it very clearly in the Bible. See, it's important that you look in your Bible, in a Bible, and look at it for yourself. Don't rely on what some preacher says, what some man says. I can get it wrong. I can mess it up, and lots of men have messed this up. Listen to what it says. Romans, the Bible, Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace shall abound? Certainly not. How shall we who die to sin live any longer in it? Hmm, what's he talking about here? Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were what? Baptized into His death. Therefore we are Look what it says. Buried with Him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now, verse 5 is very important. Listen to what he says. He says, For if we have been united together in the likeness, in other words, similar, the same sort of thing, the likeness of His death, we also shall be in the likeness, same sort of thing, of His resurrection. So what we have, according to Romans chapter 6, 1 through 6, is we see Jesus Christ, the gospel, dead. He dies, He's buried, He's raised again. What do we do? We die, metaphorically. Then we're buried under water. Then we're raised up again. I want you to notice something that's... The Bible is so beautiful in the what it describes. Look in verse 17. Romans chapter 6, verse 17. I hope this will put it together for you. He says, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed. You obeyed that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Now that word form, there is a word that means pattern. It means model. It means a a copy. So I want you to notice something. If you look at the form, the pattern of Jesus, He died, He was buried, He raised again, are we not doing that same thing? Whenever we die, we're buried, raised again. You see that pattern? You see that model? You see that similarity? I hope 
that helps clarify about what we're talking about when we say there is a commitment, that there is more to it than just believing, that there is a process, there is the whole process is that you must hear the gospel, you must believe the gospel, you must repent of your sins. Remember what I said about the sum of thy word is truth? Because Jesus said in Luke chapter 13, verse 3, that if you don't repent, you'll perish. So that's part of it. Then he says, confess. Matthew 10, verse 32. If you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. See, there's another part of it. And then we just read Romans chapter 6 where he says, we are buried in baptism in the likeness. And that's why Paul would say, would say that we need to, excuse me, let me back up. Peter would tell them, whenever they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? He says, repent and be baptized. When Ananias came to Paul, he said, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Jesus Christ himself said, believe and be baptized. You see, it's all connected. It's all part of it. This is why we need to understand that calling on the name of the Lord Calling on the name of the Lord is more than just audibly pronouncing His name. It is this process. It is part of what Jesus' will is. His desire for us is to obey His commands. He says, if you love me, you'll obey my commands, John 14, 15. And until we do exactly as the Lord has commanded, we will not be saved. You know, I think I've referenced him often, but think of Naaman. In 2 Kings chapter 5, Naaman had leprosy. And the prophet told him to go dip seven times in the Jordan. Not two times in the Mississippi. Not three times in the Blackwater. Seven times in the Jordan. But what did Naaman say? But I thought, those words are in there doesn't matter what you think, Naaman, until you do exactly what God says, you will not be saved. We think about so many other times whenever we don't want to do, in the religious world today, so many people don't want to do exactly what God says. But I think, or I thought, or what I believe, doesn't matter. And he would also think that learning this, that everybody, that everyone would want to obey the gospel. That everybody would want to be a part of the kingdom of God. To have hope of eternal life. But going back to our passage, that's why he says, but Isaiah says, Lord, who hath believeth our report? You see, the reason being is because the lie, Satan's number one lie, has not changed since the days of creation. Do you realize that? And that point is, you don't have to obey God. That's what he told Eve. You don't have to obey God. You eat that apple and you're going to be just as smart as he is. You're going to have everything. You don't have to obey God. That's what he said to all of the Israelites traveling. You don't have to obey God. That's what he said to the men in that first day of Pentecost. You don't have to obey God. That's why Jesus came. To show us, no, you must obey His voice. So faith cometh by hearing. Hearing by the Word of God. What that teaches us is it is a faith. It is a faith that produces salvation. And it is so important when it comes to calling upon the name of the Lord that we understand what that means. That there is a coming to Jesus. And that means you need to submit to His will. When you call upon His name, you're bending to His desire. And then if you call upon His name, you need to have that comprehension. Let the Word of God penetrate into your heart. And then act upon it by committing yourself to Him. By going through those steps of salvation. Because Jesus is not a buffet. You can't just pick and choose what you want. You have to do exactly what He says to do. And He's been very clear about that. And so the question once again becomes, how well do you hear? How well are you hearing God's voice? Because 
Unfortunately, there are so many people suffering from hearing loss. There are millions who are doing nothing about it and not being protected. And and the, the hope is there. It's right there to be able to use it. And yet, many people don't avail themselves to that help. Are you hearing Jesus' voice? Is He calling to you through His Word? Do you need to make your life right with God? Either if you are a Christian already and you need to make your life right, or if you want to become a Christian and you want to make your life right with God, respond to the invitation song, to the invitation of Jesus right now as together we stand and we sing. I am resolved no longer to leave.